which did include the first uh, overwintering by miners. I have there in the top uh, left corner their mining claim. Um, those of you who, will, who don't know Spitsbergen, I have a map later on where I show you just how small this claim is compared to other British claims that were laid, made at a later stage. Bottom right is a little overview of the situation of the um, company's uh, operations on Spitsbergen. You can see the fjord, the typical shipping transport and the steep hill and mountain sides that they were trying to operate on. Perhaps not the ideal environment. I should say also that I don't want to give you the impression that these were huge companies. <coughs> the office in Britain was usually someone's home or someone's work address. And uh, what you see in these pictures is their endeavour. So you see uh, the bottom left, the mining settlement itself, and the top right, um, the pithead arrangements, a shed, and the uh, self-acting incline. Um, you will notice that the bottom two pictures are actually postcards because at the time, uh, Edwin City was hailed at the northernmost town in the world. Now here's a term I'm using, political heavyweights. I since thought that maybe I should use a reference to card games and call it a Trump card. Um, Emerson Mustard Bainbridge was a very successful collier, coal owner in uh, Newcastle and then throughout Yorkshire at the time, and a very influential person in the coal trade in Britain. He also uh, tried his hand at politics and was a Minister of Parliament for Gainsborough. Don't ask me where that is. Between those years, um, but only to enhance his own coal trade in the UK. Now, to come back to the Trump card, he would possibly be like an eight or something. Not really something you would win the game with. So, they, this company used him to correspond with the Foreign Office. And Bainbridge wrote to Lansdowne in 1904 and said, Well, you see, as Spitsburg is a country under no particular flag, the parties who risk their capital there are wishful to know the steps which the Foreign Office would be able to take to protect against other countries. So he opened uh, personal correspondence with the Foreign secret Secretary and was rewarded with the simple statement, any mining operations there must be under the risk of the promoters of the undertaking. End of discussion. That was pretty much the stance the Foreign Office took. That was pretty much the stance that was repeated <coughs> in the books about British government attitude at the time. However, the, the company did have supporters elsewhere. For instance, there was an MP for Dumbartonshire, I know what that is, uh, in Parliament, who in 1907 pointed out that there had been a strike um, at the company uh, settlement on Spitsbergen in 1906-1907 and asked if the Foreign Minister was aware that um, this attack was made upon a British subject on Spitsbergen, indicating that the British government had um, a obligation to protect British sub subject. And uh, Gray replied that at the time that there was a time delay between the outbreak and the news and it was impossible to send a warship. So even if the actual situation had warranted such a step, the Foreign Office wouldn't have taken it. Again, end of discussion. This company did not really take it any further than this, did not consolidate their claims as such, didn't really attract any investors, and I'll swiftly move on. The second company, the Northern Exploration Company, similar dates. Um, and here you see the claim map that I was talking about, much larger extent. And for those of you, oh, I can do this, can't I? That dot, hurrah, is where the first company had their claims, and this one is much more widely uh, spread. And in the top right corner, you can see my company directors being very proud of their claims at the time. And bottom right shows you one of their extensive um, settlements. Uh, this one is at Research Bay, used it as headquarters at the time of their 1918-1919 expeditions to the island. It's just to give you an overview, and again, their office uh, in Britain was someone's home address. They had more trump cards, um, starting off with a reverend gardener. Now, he himself was perhaps not so influential, but however, he was the friend of Paul Harvey, who was a very influential financial advisor on the Greek Debt Commission. This was how politics worked at the time. Um, Salter was an accomplished sportsman and doctor, so as far as British society went, he was uh, an accomplished gentleman. And then later on, uh, throughout the company history, you had uh, ministers in Parliament, uh, inf influential people such as Britain, whose picture is at the top right. Um, Commander Craig uh, Callan Norman was released from the Admiralty to go on these expeditions specifically to come back with reports for the Admiralty to use. And there we have a the, um, the, uh, sorry, uh, Lieutenant Morton received the Victoria Cross and was released from the War Office to form his opinion on Spitsbergen as well. So at the time there was increasing interest and perhaps you can go from 
Gardner being a five to perhaps uh, Borden being a, a jack or something. So the trump cards were increasing and their political, political wranglings also included personal correspondence with the Foreign Office warranting the reply that everything is done at own risk but then they actually march up to the Foreign Office and have discussions where plans get deposited in a bank and not with the Foreign Office. They don't want to take any responsibility at that point. But in 1910, this changes slightly because the NEC, the Northern Exploration Company, is capable of lodging the plans with the Foreign Office. This is a very important act. You're giving your uh, claim maps to the Foreign Office. They lock it up. They can no longer pretend they don't know that you're active there. 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is a very important... Um, uh, how do you say this now? Um, stimulant, I suppose, of British action, NEC action on Spitsbergen because the Germans showed an increased interest in the Isles of Spitsbergen and we couldn't have that in 1918. The strong anti-German feelings were not such that a British company could just let that happen. And their next expedition was approved and fitted out by the Foreign Office and the Admiralty. It um, used names such as Shackleton and Wilde um, to advertise the endeavour, although Sh Shackleton was later recalled and never went. 1919, the uh, German plot was enough of a reason to really increase public geopolit geopolitical interest of uh, annexation. And in 1919, also the NEC makes an attempt to uh, go to the Paris with the Paris delegation to uh, Paris and um, mm -hmm. and uh, make a case for annexation of Britain. But then, uh, at the same time, the NEC had some dealings with a Swedish company who was seen to be an enemy, although neutral, an enemy power at the time. And in 1925, the NEC, it, it dwindled away to looking forward to cooperation with Norway. So the arguments of annexations um, dwindled away. Again, these trump cards didn't really come to anything. Now, how much can I tell you about British government attitudes in a, in a, in a second? Well, here we have a picture of a young Winston Churchill that you might not have seen before, and he had a very long political career. He also personally didn't really believe in the merits of Spitsbergen. So what I want to see uh, show in these quotes is that as the first Lord of Admiralty in 1912, he said his expert advisors have given him no reason that a claim would at all be useful. And at the same time, he was, uh, not sorry, not at the same time, but five years later, he was Minister of Munitions and pretty much said the same thing, that there were no naval reasons to annex Spitsbergen. So government attitudes were very much uh, partly personal and partly based on strategic, economic and other reasons not really having the impact that these companies had wished for. Hindsight or conclusions were already written by a company director in 1933. I personally really love this quote. I then went along to the Foreign Office and saw Lord Percy, Private Secretary of Lord Lansdowne, the Foreign Minister. He and I talked for two or three hours, and I said I wanted England to take possession of the whole of Spitsbergen. And he said, okay, I'll do anything I can do as long as this is not a causeless belly. We cannot fight about it. All I know now is that if we, as the Northern Exploration Company, did anything, it would be a causeless belly for us. It would be a reason to go to war over for us. Your name on maps certainly strikes you as being very important at the time, but it does not constitute real possession, and you may depend on it. If we had any real colors to fly, if we had any real trump cards, then we would have flown them. I leave you with this fantastic geopolitical statement. It is a map um, of how the Northern Exploration Company saw the world at the time. It is using the same colors to paint Spitsbergen as the Foreign Office and the Colonial Offices were using to color the rest of the British colonies around the globe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Can you expand a bit more, perhaps, on the, on the reasons why uh, Britain would not be interested in Spitsbergen, given already the, the, the huge empire they had at the time and their expansionism? Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is the part where I have to explain the history of the entire British Empire, I think, and uh, the reasons for the First World War. And the, uh, <laughs> I do actually think that a lot of it has to do with the general political atmosphere at the time. That Britain was involved everywhere else, as well as on Spitsbergen. 
um, that people like uh, the first Lord of, uh, Lord of the Admiralty and the Minister of Munitions were dealing with so many other issues at the same time. Um, and that although Switzerland was said to have perhaps the, uh, the important iron resources and uh, coal resources to make more munitions, uh, important to the Ministry of Munitions, the Northern Exploration Company did such a bad job at advertising them, or at, at um, being realistic about them, that I think the government in general was almost weary of them by that point. They used a lot of uh, rhetoric, they used a lot of propaganda, anti-German propaganda, and you know, pro-our resources propaganda, anti-Norwegian propaganda, that um, even I at times am thinking, oh come on, you know, get back on the carpet and, and keep it real. And I do think it's a, it's a mix of both. The general climate and the overacting by the companies. Thank you. I think then we should uh, shall move on to the next presentation. We can